Hey guys, welcome to Toy Shop. Today, I just wanna give you a little background about who I am and what I've done in this field. Pretty much from as early as I can remember, my dad had always worked on people's snowmobiles in our garage at home growing up. He also worked full-time in a manufacturing job, so when he got home around three or 3.30, he would go down to the garage and start working in the garage until like 10 at night. Anytime I wanted to see my dad, I would go down to the garage, and that's pretty much how I grew up. Always down there tinkering with stuff and always had stuff to ride, always had lots of different snowmobiles to ride, when I was like three or four, I had a little Yamaha Trizinger that was the first thing I ever rode with a motor. When I was probably 10 or 11, we started grass dragging snowmobiles. We had this little yellow sled called a Little Skipper, and that thing pretty much kicked all the newer Z120s and stuff like that, kicked all their butts. So started getting a little older, got a CRF 100. The neighbors gave us a free four-wheeler, so I had a four-wheeler to ride. Always just had a bunch of stuff to ride and play with. I learned a lot of stuff from my dad just being in the garage, and it definitely sparked my interest in wrenching. When I was getting close to graduating high school, I thought I wanted to go to school to be a mechanic, but my dad kind of steered me away from it because he said, if you enjoy wrenching in the garage, then if you make it your full-time job, you will no longer enjoy doing it. So I decided to stay away from that. In high school, there was a VOTAC program that took machining in high school. So I carried that through and went to a trade school to become a CNC machinist. While I was going to school though, I got a part-time job as a power sport mechanic. So I did that part-time. I learned a lot of stuff there and it really helped to build my confidence and tearing all this stuff apart. There's not really very many things that I'm scared to tear apart, but I wanna say that part-time job is really what kind of helped to really get my knowledge in this type of stuff. While I was working at that little shop, we also restored two different uh, vintage Raiders, which are twin track snowmobiles. Doing that whole process was actually a lot of fun because you got to tear everything completely apart. It didn't matter if it was broke or not because you had to make it look pretty so we could put it back together. So we did two Raiders back to back. We did the motor, stripped the chassis all the way down to the bare tubes, fixed any holes that were in it, resheated it, sent the bodywork out to get painted. That's the one part that I didn't really have much to do in. Paint is a new thing for me, but as far as the mechanics go, it was all brand new or restored. So both those Raiders turned out really nice. So about that time, getting into my late teens, I was working a lot, I had a truck. Um, I'd always grown up riding, but I never raced anything. So there's a local track 45 minutes away from where I live. Me and a buddy of mine, we drove up to the track and it was the last race of the season. So we watched some race and I was like, shit, wait, I can do this. Like, this looks easy. These are just like tabletops, super easy. So I bought an old race bike, tore it apart, made it look all pretty and stuff. And then that next spring we went to the first practice and well, yeah, I was, that was not fast at all, but it was fun. So, and it actually wasn't that expensive either. So I started racing, I had four stroke at first. I had an 05 KX 250F, so it was a carbureted four stroke. And I remember the very first race I did, I was in D class, the gate dropped and we all went into the first turn and there was just a big pile up because it's just a bunch of goonie kids in D class. I wipe out, I get myself up and get myself dusted off. The bike stalled and I kicked and kicked and kicked and kicked and kicked and that bike would not start. I finally got it started when and the leader finished his first lap. The bike finally started. So then I took off and I didn't finish dead last, which is my only goal. I wanted to not finish last my first race, but that's how my first race went. I finished off that season on the 250F and then I ended up trading that for a 450. I practiced for that one time and then I overshot a tabletop and landed into the face of the next jump and landed on my nuts really hard and I wasn't trying to. So I was like, this bike's too much. Like I'm gonna get nervous or something. I'm gonna just to grab more throttle and the bike's just gonna take off and I'm gonna end up hurting myself. So I traded the 450 for an 01 YZ250. And that was the first 252 stroke motocross bike I ever had. And when I got on it and actually started practicing, like holy crap, like the 254 stroke was like nothing compared to it. I kept getting arm pump really bad on the two stroke. Like it was just a completely different animal. Like the ass end wanted to walk all the time. Like it was just completely different. It was a lot of fun, like a lot of fun. I stuck with that bike until like 2018 and then I bought this bike brand new in 18. Got that, I raced a couple years on that. Then I turned 25 and like this winter before I started going to the gym a lot, working out, getting my endurance built up, really just trying to trying to actually become competitive. And I went to this big event that was probably an hour and a half from me and I ended up landing on top of a kid on a jump. Here, I'll show you guys. <laughs>
And that was kind of it for my racing career. I was like 25, I didn't own a house. I lived with my parents still. I had a brand new race bike and a truck. And I was kind of like, well, I'm getting old enough. I should probably start slowing down. I was racing a lot of like 17, 18 year old kids and I was 25 and I still wasn't like lightning fast or anything. So I was like, well, I've had a lot of fun with this, but I think it's time to like, kind of like start looking at some big boy moves, like trying to buy a house or something like that. A house kind of kitty corner from my parents' house had been for sale for like six or seven years. And I really had no interest in trying to buy the house. So I was talking to my old boss and he's like, why don't you buy that place? There's a huge garage there. It's like, yeah, I don't know. So I ended up getting hold of a realtor, started talking to him. I ended up buying it and that's what the garage is. This is just a little one acre lot. And this is kind of where I do my YouTube. The garage kind of consists of three bays. There's the main bay or the red part of the garage. There's the middle bay and then there's the end bay. So the end bay, that's where I keep everything that I want to kind of keep out of the weather, but I'm not working on it right now. So it's either something I haven't touched yet or it's something that is fine to just ride. I just park it out there so it's out of the weather and stuff, but it's not something I'm actively working on. The end bays, I keep locked up and stuff. So it's out of the weather and it's safe. That's pretty much what the end bay is. There's no heat in it. It's dry. And it's good for what it is. It's got cement in it. Now the middle bay, that's kind of just like a glorified lean-to. This slides in here because it's too damn heavy to move. On um, the air compressors in here, just so it keeps everything good and quiet in the main part of the garage. And then the main bay. So this is the main bay in here. When I bought the place, there was three garage doors in it. There was no insulation anywhere, no electricity in it, no gas hookups or anything in it, but we've gutted every single wall, restudded everything, resheated the outside, uh, hung a new ceiling, ran lights in it, got electricity run to the garage. Because I've got water in here, I gotta keep this heated in the winter. Uh, I live in Western New York and we're known for lake effect snow. Snowmobile trails are huge around here. So we get a lot of snow, it's cold, and it's nice having a warm garage to work in. The heat bill is kind of expensive, but I've got spray foam insulation on all four walls and the ceiling. So it actually heats really good. And it's not a huge garage. It's just a two bay garage. I think it's 24 by 32. Well, I was working at the small engine shop. We started getting tool trucks in. My boss had told me, he's like, hey, people in this industry need to have their own tools. Obviously I was working out of his toolbox at the time and I had an interest for it. So I wanted to buy my own tools anyways. So I remember the very first thing I bought off a tool truck was a Mack truck and I bought the long reach needle nose pliers. And after that, I was pretty much just like hook, line and sinker. Like I had the bug. I wasn't making a whole lot of money there and I had rent to pay and stuff. And the water bill is what got away from me there, the water bill. But I have this now, all of these tools because I didn't pay the water bill, which is where my deposit went when I ended up moving out of that apartment. But anyways, I've got cool tools now. I didn't start off with this great big toolbox. I started off with just a little one with like a little slide top on it. Outgrew that, traded it in on a snap-on toolbox, which I don't know if I recommend that or not because they're expensive. I definitely think you can get away with a Husky now or US General. Like you just need something to hold tools. I'm not like a, oh, snap-on, like whatever. They're nice, but they're not that nice. But that kind of started my tool addiction. I started getting nicer and nicer tools, going for variety more so and then started replacing it with better quality. But that's kind of what started the bug on the tools. And now that I'm an adult, I've actually pretty much don't ever buy tools anymore. I've got all my bases covered. I've got my, my wrenches and my sockets and my pliers and hammers and stuff. So if I need something, it's usually like a specialty type tool and I just go to Harbor Freight or order it online or something like that. So once we restored this part of the garage, I was like, I wanna kind of start making a little money out of it, like kind of wrenching on people's stuff here and there. I was like, be a nice way to make a hundred bucks here and there and stuff. And and I found out pretty quickly that I didn't like that. First off, once word starts getting out that you work on stuff, that spreads quick. Like everybody's like, hey, I got this. You want to fix it? Hey, you want to fix this? And it wouldn't be so bad. But most of the time it's people being like, hey, I have this four wheeler that quit running 17 years ago and I parked it out behind the barn. I don't remember if it lost spark or if it ran out of gas or I don't know, but it hasn't been covered or anything. And I think the dog chewed at it and the mice have been in the wiring harness and stuff. And you wanna see if you can get that running? It's like, well, yeah, probably, but I might have like eight hours of labor in it just diagnosing the, the wiring. And even if I charge 50 bucks an hour, that's 400 bucks in just labor. The wheeler's not worth 400 bucks. You might as well take 600 and buy something that's running because this one's rotted anyway. So those kind of seem to be the jobs that were coming in. 
And when I would do a job, it wasn't that bad. I felt guilty about charging labor. And I just didn't like the whole aspect of asking people for money. And I don't really understand it either because I've never not worked on my own stuff. So asking people to give me money so I can do a carburetor clean on their four-wheeler just sounds weird. Like it takes me an hour to do it, but I'm gonna charge somebody 50 bucks. It just feels weird. But that's how you run a business. And I was like, I don't really like that. I wanna work on stuff, but I don't wanna to have to ask people for money. So I started doing a lot of research and stuff. And then I kind of found YouTube and I was like, kind of like the idea of this. I can work on stuff. As long as I make it interesting enough that you guys will watch it, then I can get paid on ads and not have to ask anybody for any money. And really, if I can make stuff interesting enough or or specific enough that people will watch it, then I could even work on other people's stuff for free and still get something for it, which seemed to be kind of like the perfect storm. So I was like, I'm gonna try this YouTube thing. So I started making some pretty bad videos, which they're still not that great, but they're getting better. Started making some videos and some of you guys seem to like some of these. So I kind of, kind of keep doing it and I'm having a lot of fun with it. I kind of have niched myself down now to the point to where I just kind of want to do power sport restorations. I don't really want to work on people's stuff. I don't really want to fix spark issues or something. I kind of just want to like get machines in, get them running. Once they're running and I know it's worth restoring, then tear the whole thing completely apart and bringing the machine back to life. So that's what I want to do. So this is kind of dating this video, but this Moto 4, I've put a ton of time and a lot of money. This shit's expensive, but I've done it to this Moto 4 because I'm trying to learn the basics and I didn't want to do it on something that was actually valuable. Like I didn't want to go try to find a 250R and do all this stuff on or go buy a Banshee and try to do all this stuff on because I've done a lot of learning. Like even just in the paint on this wheeler, I started off with Rust-Oleum and then I didn't like the Rust-Oleum because when you tighten a bolt to it, the paint peels off. So I'm trying this PJ1 paint now and that's like seems to be better, but it's still not the quality I want. So I just started talking to a guy that I know that used to do a lot of body work and I watched him do some painting with an actual paint gun and that actually doesn't look that hard. So I now want to transition away from rattle cans to actual spray paint like with the air compressor and stuff like that. So just the paint part alone, like if I would have painted a whole I don't know, 350X with Rust-Oleum, and then somebody goes and rides it, and then you gotta pressure wash it, and half the paint blows off the frame, that would not be very good. And I wouldn't wanna completely redo that project again by stripping it down to the frame again, sandblasting all the Rust-Oleum off just to paint it all over again. So I figured this Moto 4 is simple, it's easy to learn on. The zinc plating that I've done, that was a lot of learning to that part too. I know a lot of the first bolts that I did, they're kind of starting to rust a little bit now because I didn't do them right, which I need to take them back off again. I started with the rear end of the four wheeler and now I'm up to the front and these bolts are all look beautiful. So I'm super happy with that. But again, I wouldn't want bolts that I had already spent a lot of time on to start to rust on something that was valuable. This Moto 4 I'll probably never get rid of because I've got so much money in it, it's not worth it. I think it's just gonna be my little trailer queen for now. Maybe pull a little yard cart around in the springtime when we're doing yard work. So I wanna kind of give you a little tour of the garage. We got Sandblaster here. My dad works for the company that builds this rack. So I ended up getting this rack stuff for free. This right here is my zinc plating kit. That's the degreaser, the power supply, both solutions. The air compressor is right on the other side of the wall there. It comes in pretty much right behind this power supply. It comes up, goes into a little bit of a dryer and stuff, and then up into my hose reel. Uh, these hose reels are awesome, actually. I got a lot of my sandblasting stuff down here. This is a lot of parts for KDX 450 that's in the other bay. This banner and this banner here may have been illegally confiscated from Unadilla. When we were camping after the pro race, we went out to the track and they were just giving this out for free as long as you went out on the track and grabbed it and nobody caught you. That's where all those came from. Those are pretty sweet. Um, over here in this corner, this is kind of my fluids corner. That's a coolant drum from work. That's got all my waste oil in it and stuff. I keep my gas cans over here. And then I've got two parts washers. This one's filthy. And this is my one that's kind of more clean. So I pre-clean them here and then I can put them in here if I want to finish cleaning them really good. Then we got the old toolboxes. I got that Craftsman one because it, it works really well for a lot of the little stuff in here. Right here's a lot of my GoPro stuff in here. Right there's a drill index. I'm a Milwaukee fanboy for life. I love my Milwaukee stuff. I've got some little toys here. My fiance, soon to be wife's dad works at Matco and got these made for Christmas for us, which I really like that. I've completely sticker bombed the whole inside of this. 
a Unadilla High Point Penton sticker. That's from uh, Cameron Namella. So I, ended up, I bought some stickers from him. Just pretty much, I've got one of everything on here that I've ever had. And then every toolbox needs to have a sticker drawer. So this is just a drawer full of stickers that, yeah. Well, I even got some stickers spilling out on the side. But you saw the sticker drawer. We got kind of some chemicals and stuff in there. Got some bolts and easy outs and stuff in here. Kind of a miscellaneous drawer. Miscellaneous little hardware kits. Pins and O-rings and stuff like that in there. A couple manuals, a uh, flywheel puller. A lot of dirt bike or power sport specific tools. Got a case splitter and a valve seal installer and a tappet tool. This is a fork seal slide hammer thing. Works super awesome. They're plastic and they weren't, it wasn't ridiculously expensive. Right there's a lot of power sport stuff. In here is my electric drawer. So I got a lot of my connectors, my multimeter, all my electric stuff. This is my socket drawer. So I pretty much have my whole toolbox split down the middle. This is my American stuff and this is my metric stuff. Clearly I've got more metric than I do American because there's not hardly anything in this industry that's American except Polaris bodywork. And then that's a three quarter inch drive socket set that goes up to like three inch or two and three quarters of an inch. So that's a big boy. I use those mainly for pressing sockets in because they're really big in diameter. Same with this drawer here, my wrench drawer split down the middle. This is all metric. That's all American. This is that first toolkit that I bought that I had mentioned. Right here's the big ones and here's the little ones. Here's my plier and screwdriver drawer. This real skinny drawer is my things that you smack with a hammer. Here are said hammers to smack things with. And then it kind of goes into a couple of miscellaneous drawers of stuffs and things, grinders, air impact, all my air tools are in here. And then my kind of big stuff drawer. Right here's the old junk drawer that's full of everything. That's a toolbox tour. That's a 76 RD400. It's a twin cylinder air cooled 400, two stroke street bike. And then there's the 2018 YZ250. That's got probably 60 hours on it. It's had one top end in it, but it's supposedly supposed to have a crank in it now, according to the book, but it runs fine. They look cool stacked on top of each other, but really the main reason I did it is because I didn't have the heart to stick either one of these out in the end bay all winter. So I kind of wanted to keep them heated all year long. So I always had them sitting next to each other on the other side of the workbench here, but they took up a ton of room. So I was like, well, if I could stack them, I could save room. So that's what I did. And I kind of made like a little show of it. It's kind of funny because the RD here, I had to strap the forks down and in order to actually get it to fit, but it does fit. So now I've got a place to kind of hang my helmets along the side and stuff. That's my makeshift exhaust fan that I have like cardboarded into the window, which works good for now. I don't want to cut the tin. I hate cutting tin. So I'm just utilizing one of the windows for an exhaust fan. This was a free desk, free microwave, free mini fridge, free filing cabinet, free office chair. So this whole setup here was free. I'm an, an Amsoil dealer right there. So I've got this big banner. I thought it was pretty cool. So I bought the banner and it wasn't that, that expensive. Uh, the Mutt's beds, because the dogs like to come here and hang out and that's somewhere cozy for them to lay other than the cold cement floor. Uh, we got a gas heater here. This stinks when I fire it up in the garage, so I try not to run that that much. We got some old toys, press, buffer, motorcycle stand that has a motor tour part on it. That's just a miscellaneous shelf with a battery charger and ultrasonic cleaner on it right there. I've got some Amsoil product here. Those are my old Hot Wheel cars from when I was growing up. Uh, that motor right there goes into this sled here. It's a Z570. This is a good motor. The motor that was in that other one was junk. So that kind of concludes the garage tour. I also want to mention that right after I got into that dirt bike wreck and stuff and, and bought this place here, I met this really wonderful girl on the old Tinder actually. And uh, we started dating and we got engaged this summer and we're getting married in about a week. So not long after this video is posted, I will be a married man. I'm sure you've seen her in the background of a lot of videos that I've made. She's always here hanging out, whether she's bored or not. She does a lot of landscaping in the summer to keep her occupied, but she likes being here. So I had to put a ring on it, but that's pretty much me. That's my story. That's kind of what gives me some, if any, credentials to kind of tell you guys how to do stuff on YouTube. I'm hoping I can do many more projects. I can put them all on YouTube for you guys to enjoy. And I thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to do this. I'm starting to make a little bit of money on YouTube, which is good because I've got a lot of hours in this like a lot of hours, but I'd enjoy it. If I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't do it. So thank you guys. And until next time, peace.